Good to see you guys. There are a lot of places you could be today, of course, and uh, I know sitting in the sun in a parking lot, not the most comfortable environment perhaps, but praise God, we have the opportunity to come to a place where we can sing praise to God and how good he's been to us. We have the opportunity then to open his word, and uh, I hope that you're cherishing these times. Again, this is a time that we'll all look back on and be thankful for as we get into the building and we see all that God is doing next door. Uh, if you're not following the church's Instagram page, you need to. Uh, updates not only about church and what's happening in our church life, but right now updates about what is happening uh, in the building are there as well. Every week a video is posted, so go and check that out. That is uh, fantastic, and I hope that you'll do that. Take your Bibles this morning if you have them, Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah chapter 43. As Jonathan mentioned, next week pastor will be back with us. And he is beginning a new series of messages. Uh, so please be back, be in your place next week. Bring someone with you. If you're visiting our church today, thank you for being here. Uh, again, I know it's been said, but this is an unusual situation, of course, uh, but really one that as a church family we're thankful for because it means progress. It means that God is working. For the last several years, we have been praying and working and uh, doing everything that we could do to see this renovation take place, a renovation that will add many, many seats in our auditorium, that's going to expand our children's space, that's going to open up opportunities that we've been praying for for a long time. So we're very grateful for that and uh, glad to have you with us. But be back next week with our pastor, and uh, he is excited. I know he's excited about this ser sermon series because he started talking about it probably three months ago. So I know, I know he's excited about it, and uh, we're all going to benefit from that. Isaiah chapter 43. Uh, this is my last message to you out of this chapter this morning, and uh, I'm always a little bit sad when I come to the end of a series of messages. I've enjoyed studying this together with you, and uh, I trust that it's been an encouragement to you as well. We began our series by looking at verse number one. Verse number one of Isaiah chapter 43 but now thus saith the Lord that created thee. I'll remind you, if you go back one chapter, we see that there are some judgments being made on the nation of Israel. In fact, God says to the nation of Israel, you have disregarded me. You don't listen to me. Uh, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. We come to verse number one of chapter 43. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee. So the prophet is speaking for God and he says, hey, uh, God wants you to know he doesn't like that you're not listening to him. <laughs> I mentioned that Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1 in a lot of ways is the most dad verse in all of the Bible because his children are disobedient. And then he begins speaking to them. He says, uh, O Jacob, and he, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. So God, with the backdrop of the previous chapter, he says, look, don't be afraid. Why? For I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. And what a truth to know that we are God's. He calls us by our name. That means he knows who we are. We're going to consider that again in today's message. But beyond knowing who we are, he says, not only do I know your name, you're an individual to me, you matter to me, but you belong to me. And what a truth it is to know that we belong to God. But with that, with him telling us that we are his, thou art mine, that means something. What does it mean that we belong to God? Well, the first thing we considered a few weeks ago was that God, we belong to him, which means he is present in our lives. We look at the first few verses of this chapter and God explains his presence in our lives. He's present when we're in the water that seems to be overflowing. He's present when we're in the fire uh, that's so hot, those situations that we cannot understand, that we feel like we can't get out of. God says, I'm always with you. Good bad or otherwise, you are mine, which means I'm always present in your life. We asked the question last week, what does it matter if a God who calls us by our name, who says we belong to him, who offers his presence to us, what does it matter if he says those words, but doesn't have the power to follow through? Last week, we continued through our passage, and God not only says that he's present, but then he declares in no uncertain terms that he has the power to do what he said he will do. Amen. <laughs> 
God explains his power. First of all, he talks about himself as the redeemer. And if God can save, then there's nothing God cannot do. So that's where he begins. He says, I'm with you. You are mine. I am your God. And I prove it as I redeem you. We know coming to the New Testament that Jesus Christ, the son of God, he left heaven. He came to earth. He lived a perfect sinless life. He died on the cross in our place to pay the price for our sin. Why? Because he is our redeemer. Because he and he alone can save. Amen. Amen. <laughs> what a truth. But not only is he our redeemer, we see, and we looked at this last week, he said, I'm your redeemer, I save you, but I also fight for you. And what a truth. We find ourselves in the battles of life, these battles that we do not understand, perhaps we did not anticipate. Maybe it's something we got ourselves into, but God, our redeemer, the one who says he's always with us, also proclaims that he fights on our behalf. Final point of last week's message was that not only is he our redeemer, he saves, not only does he fight for us, but he makes a way. He, using the illustration of the nation of Israel as they came to the Red Sea, God declares that he parts the sea and he dries the ground and he does the same in our own lives. What situation are you facing that seems insurmountable? Understand that your God who knows your name, who says you belong to him, who says he's present in your life, has the power to redeem you, to fight for you, and to make a way where no way seems possible. What a truth. <laughs> we continue this morning. And the final discussion we'll have in this passage is found in verse number 18. We'll look at verses 18 and 19. In verse 18, we read these words, Remember ye not the former things, Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Say new thing with me. New thing. He'll do what? A new thing. God will do a new thing. It, he goes on. He explains this. I love this verse. I've spent hours pondering and meditating on this verse. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I know we only have a few minutes together this morning. On the back of that handout you received when you came in, there's a brief outline. Uh, do me a favor. I'm going to go through a lot of verses. I'm going to say a lot of stuff. I'm going to say it fast because it's hot outside. Write it down. You can go back to it later. <laughs> but this is so important. The God who says, I am always with you, the God who declares he has the power to keep his word, then makes a statement that should resonate with every single one of us. In the New Testament, we read some very important verses, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul declares, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What the Apostle Paul was declaring is that if you are in Christ, if you have a relationship with God because of the shed blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, you're not trying to reconstruct your life. You're not being put back together. You are, in fact, a new creation. And that changes everything. We find also in Revelation 21 and verse 5, coming to the end of the Bible, these words, and he that sat upon the throne said, that's God, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and fruitful. I ask you a question this morning. Do you need God to do a new thing in your life? Do you look at your life, where you've been, what you've done? You, you look at your current circumstance and you ask the question, how did I get here? Why am I here? I've worked so hard. I thought I'd be further along. I find myself in a desert situation in life. I need God to do a new thing. Do you need God to do a new thing in your life? What would it look like if God did a new thing in your life? Do you believe <laughs> that he can? You see, the order of the sermons we've considered up to this point were not by accident. They lay out directly in the passage we've understood that God calls us by name. He is always present. He has the power to do what he says. Those things set the stage for his declaration that he wants to do a new thing in our lives. We're going to get to the outline in just a minute, but before we do, we have to look at verse number 18 of chapter 43. Because this is the premise, this is the baseline of all of it. Remember 
ye not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Verse 19 is our message. Verse 19 is our outline. But verse 19 does not matter if we don't take verse 18 seriously. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you get so caught up in the past, it's hard for you to move forward? That's most of us. <laughs> how many of you have something in your past you're not proud of, something that you did that you don't want others to know about? Maybe they do know about it, and because of that, you're stuck there. Uh, many of us have had things done to us in our past. It wasn't something that we asked for, not something that we created, but it's there. And we can't get past the shame. We can't get past the hurt. We can't get past the brokenness. And so we're stuck there. Perhaps you were better in the past than you are right now. You were more successful. Something was going really well. And a series of decisions or a series of circumstances have taken you to a place where you're not feeling the same success you once did. Here's what we need to understand from verse 18. Before we can experience the new thing that God wants to do in our life, we have to stop going back to the past. You are not the sum total of the good things that happened in your past nor are you the sum total of the bad things that happened in your past. Your past should inform your present. Your past should inform your future, but your past should never define who you are. Because in Christ, we're a new creation. You are not what you once were. Before God says, I'll do a new thing, he has to start by saying, stop going back to the past. And guys, I could spend a whole message here. I won't because we need to move on. <laughs> if I had another week, that's where we would be right now. But you have to decide. You have to determine. You have to evaluate. And stop looking over your shoulder and instead say, God, what do you have for me today? And where are you taking me tomorrow? He wants to do a new thing. Number one, verse number 19 on your outline, we see this. The promise is that God will do a new thing. We see this, first of all, that it's God who does the work. Amen. <laughs> it's God who does the work. How important, how significant is that? Look at verse number 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. In my life, when I find myself in a difficult time, a difficult circumstance, a situation that maybe I created or maybe was created for me, my first thing, the first action that I want to take is me fixing the situation. I want to do a new thing. I can recognize that a new thing needs to be done. And I look at myself, I consider my resources, I think to my past being informed by that. I look at where it is that I want to go and I conclude that I can, if I try hard enough and work hard enough and do enough, I can do a new thing. This is why a lot of the motivational gurus in our world, we have access to all of them. They drive me insane because it's one thing to be motivated, but when you're motivated with the message of do more, try harder, get up earlier, and then you'll be successful, you will not be successful. You will be frustrated and fail because it's God that must do the new thing in your life. I'm so thankful that God begins right there. Behold, I will do a new thing. Philippians chapter two and verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that? Do you believe that it's God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure? 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Uh, listen, one thing I don't lack in is confidence. <laughs> one thing I don't lack in is a feeling of self-sufficiency. You have a problem, bring it to me, I'll fix it. <laughs> you have a situation, let me know, I'll take care of it. In fact, ask my family, I don't even need to hear the whole conversation. I just need to hear the first couple words and then I'll fix your problem. <laughs> but you know what the Bible says? Here's the right perspective. We are not sufficient in ourselves. And that's a good thing because it causes us to lean on the one who is, but our sufficiency, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, is of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Here's where the new work begins. It begins with understanding that it's not me who does the new work. I can't try harder. I can't do more. I can't be more. I can't get up earlier. I can't gather more resources. And we've already talked about this last week. We need to work. We need to do what we can. We are created unto love and good works. But the understanding must be that we work understanding, realizing, and hanging on to the truth that it is God who does the new work in our lives. What new work do you need? What new thing do you need? Understand that it won't happen (laughs) until you acknowledge that it's only God who can bring it to pass. We see secondly this morning, not only does God do the work, I want to pause here real quick. (laughs) Don't ever read scripture and just read over scripture. This is the divinely inspired word of God, which means that the way it is written is important. These aren't just words to fill pages. The order here is unbelievable. This is why (laughs) preaching the Bible makes sense. Look at the next thing this verse says. First of all, God says he'll do the new thing. Then he says this, now it shall spring forth. The new thing that will spring forth, that's our second point this morning, it will spring forth. I'm not a smart guy, I just use the words of the Bible. (laughs) I love this. I love this about God. I I love that God does not do anything halfway in our lives. God doesn't say he will leak out exactly what you need and only exactly what you need. Uh, God doesn't say he's going to create in you an anemic life that's going to be hard to get through. God doesn't say that he's going to do something, but you're going to have to really search to see his working in your life. This is how a lot of people feel. If God works, maybe I won't know about it. That's not how God works. When God does a new thing, it doesn't just happen. It springs forth. Not only will you know it's happening, not only will you experience it in your life, but those around you will look and they'll say, there's a spring there. That's a spring from God. God is doing a new thing. I'm so thankful that we won't miss it when God works. When God works, it will always be clear that God is working. What a truth. We understand that it's only God who can do it, but we understand that it will spring forth. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him, I know it's hot. There's a lot I want to say. I'm not going to say it. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him, that is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Verse 20 talks about Jesus Christ, the one with whom there should be all glory. But it says that he has this exceeding abundant work that is at power at work in us. It springs forth. Luke chapter 6 and verse 30, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. So thankful to hear the testimony of Brother Nathan, the work that's happening in Tokyo. You know what happens when you give? God does a new work. You know what happens when you support? God does a new work. People are saved. People are called to the ministry. A Bible school is started. Why? Because when God do, does a new work, it springs forth. Look at this again, Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. God does exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. He's going to do a new thing and it's going to spring forth. We continue. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? (laughs) It's one of those rhetorical questions. I will even make a way in the wilderness. I love this point. This is number three. He makes a way in the wilderness. Do you ever feel like God doesn't know where you are? You ever felt like that? God, do you know what I'm going through? God, do you know what I'm dealing with? God, do you understand this relationship stuff that's happening, this financial stuff that's happening, this thing that happened over work? Do you understand what's going on right now? Do you get it? 
The Bible does not just say that God will do a new thing. It doesn't just say that when God does a new thing, it springs forth. It's, it's recognizable. You'll see it. You can't miss it. This says that when God does a new thing, he meets you exactly where you are. He says, I'll do a new thing in the wilderness. This is not God saying, come to the oasis that I've created. This is not God saying, get yourself into a better situation, and then you'll see something new happen in your life. This isn't God saying, create something out of nothing. Get past your mistakes. This is not God saying any of those things. This is God saying, I know exactly where you are, and that is the place where I'll do the work, where I'll do the new thing. It's easy to believe that God doesn't know what's going on in our lives, that God is not working in our lives. But God says, look, I'm going to do a work, and I'm going to do it in the wilderness. To the nation of Israel, he's saying, I know you're in the desert. I'm going to meet you there, and I'm going to do a work. To us, he says, I know what you're going through. You feel like you're in the wilderness. You're wandering around with very little purpose and direction. You're confused. You're overwhelmed. None of this makes sense. But in all of it, I'm going to meet you where you are and do a new work. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says these words, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15, referring to our high priest, Jesus Christ, he says he knows what it's like to walk this, this earth, to walk this world, to go through the difficulties that you've been through. Matthew chapter 4, it tells us of Jesus, our Savior in the desert, in the wilderness, being tempted by Satan. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, our Savior, in the wilderness, he understands what it's like to be hungry because the Bible says he was hungry, to be thirsty because the Bible says he was thirsty, in that situation to be tempted by the devil because the Bible says he was tempted by the devil. It also gives us an example of how Jesus Christ, our Savior, rebuffed the devil using Scripture going back to the truth of who God is and what God wants to do in his life, uh, of the ministry that happened with the angels to Jesus Christ. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. We have a God who knows what it is to be in the wilderness, to meet us then in the wilderness. I don't know what your life feels like right now. Sometimes mine feels like the wilderness. I live in Murrieta, which is kind of the wilderness, so I feel that way a lot. You think it's hot today? 105 yesterday, Murrieta. Amen. <laughs> That's why there's so many Murrieta folks here today. I don't know what your life feels like. Maybe you feel like you're in the wilderness, but understand that's the place that God does the work. What a promise. We see finally this morning. As I began studying this verse, I, I wondered why God said the same thing twice, but he doesn't say the same thing twice. Verse 19, behold, I will do a new thing. He says, I'm going to do it. It shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make even a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I read that and I thought, why does God say wilderness and desert? This is the same thing. This isn't the same thing. God's making two separate points. He says, I'll meet you in the wilderness. I know what you're going through. I know where you are. I know your circumstances, your situation, your surroundings. I'm going to meet you right there. That's where I will do a new thing. But this last point is so important. He says, I will make rivers in the desert. You know what God brings to you? Exactly what you need. Have you ever gotten a gift that was really expensive and really nice, but something that you didn't care about? <laughs> like, well, that, thank you for that. I would prefer the cash, but thank you for that. <laughs> Has someone ever done something for you that was very gracious and very kind, but it wasn't super helpful? That's not how God works. See, God says, I'm going to do something new. It's me. I'm going to do it. You can't do it. I'm going to do it. And when it happens, it's going to spring forth. You're not going to be able to miss it. It's going to be in the place where you are, exactly where you are right now. I'm going to meet you. But it's also going to be exactly what you need. In the desert, the number one need is water. And God says, I'm going to bring that water, those rivers in the desert. I'm going to bring exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. 
Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your, your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In that passage, we're told to seek God, seek his will, seek his direction, and know that he will meet our needs. We've considered Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 several times, but we can't get around it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll do what? Direct your paths. He knows exactly what you need. Do you need God to do a new thing in your life? Do you feel like you're in the wilderness alone? God, do you even know I'm here? God knows where you are. God knows what you need. And God says, I will do it for you. We could go back and if you have your Bibles, you can flip back with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 20. I'll be done in just a second. The nation of Israel, they were not hearing this without context. They would have known their own history. Numbers, chapter 20, I'm going to begin reading. The children of Israel are wandering around the wilderness. They've left Egypt, of course. Numbers 20, verse 1, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zen in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there, verse 2, and there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron, and the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, What would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. They looked at what was happening. They found themselves in the wilderness. They found themselves in need of water and they could not get over what had happened in the past. Their, their past was horrible. They were slaves in Egypt. Egypt. They were abused. Uh, they were misused. They were cast out. They were chased down. And yet they looked back over their shoulder and said, we wish we were there. What did God say in the book of Isaiah? He said, first of all, you need to stop remembering the former things. You need to stop going back. But the children of Israel couldn't get past it. That's the context that the book of Isaiah chapter 43 is being written in. They're picturing what their forefathers did. They know the context. They understand it. They said to Moses in Numbers chapter 20, we wish we were back in the past. We wish we were back there. I like verse number six. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they fell upon their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. They did what you need to do when you find yourself in the wilderness. They went before God and said, God, we need you. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Don't miss that. He said, speak to the rock. This whole situation is supposed to be a picture of going before God and asking for provision, asking for God to do a new thing in the wilderness, to see those rivers springing forth. He said, speak. Verse 9, and Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, hear now ye rebels. Now, God didn't tell Moses to say that, but he was pretty upset. <laughs> he was tired. He called them rebels. He said, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. He hit it. He didn't speak to it. He hit it. Moses decided that even though God said he would do the work, Moses needed to do the work. The water did come out, but the penalty was that God said, Moses, you're not going into the promised land because you didn't trust me. I had something so much greater planned for you and the nation of Israel. The picture in Numbers chapter 20 is what's being referred to in Isaiah chapter 43. 
It's an understanding that we have a God that loves us, a God who cares for us, a God that knows us by name and calls us his own, a God who promises to be present with us in the good and in the bad, but not just to be with us, to fight for us, to make a way where there is no way because he's redeemed us, a God that wants to do a new work, a work that will spring forth in the wilderness right where we are, providing exactly what we need but we must come to him, to the rock that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. So much in this passage. But what we learn is that we have a God who is present, a God who is powerful, and a God who makes a promise to do a new thing. I wonder this morning, will you live with the joy of knowing that your God drives out fear knows your name, and calls you his own. One last time, look to Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I've called thee by thy name, thou art mine. God, we thank you for your word, for the truth of your word, for this passage, for the insight that we gain. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. Thank you that in spite of ourselves, you tell us that we should not fear because you're our Redeemer because you know us by name, because you've called us your own. Thank you for the promise of your presence. Thank you for an understanding of your power. You can and will do what you say you'll do because you're our redeemer. You fight for us. You make a way. Father, I thank you for the ultimate promise that you will do a new thing in our lives. Those that are in Christ are a new creation. We're made entirely new because of our relationship with you. God, I thank you for that truth, and I believe that along with that comes an understanding that you want to do a work in our lives, a work that's bigger than us, that only you can do, something that will be recognized, that we'll see, that we cannot miss. And you're not going to ask us to come to a better place to fix something, to change something. God, you meet us right where we are, and we thank you for that truth. What an amazing truth. We don't have to clean ourselves up or fix ourselves, dig ourselves out of some kind of a hole. We just need to look to you as the one who is sufficient because we're not sufficient of ourselves to do anything. Father, I thank you for the final words of the verse that we considered this morning, that you are going to provide rivers in the desert, streams in the desert, that means is you provide to us exactly what we need right where we are. (laughs) God, I pray that we be encouraged through your word this morning. That our faith would be increased. As you tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we've considered your word and I pray that with your presence and your power and your promise in mind, we'd have greater confidence in you trusting you to do the work that you alone can do. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.